It's been a little over four years since that terrible night that changed my life forever. I took for granted the daily routine of my life, getting up, combing my hair, walking, talking to friends, and eating in the cafeteria. These were all ordinary events which suddenly disappeared on the night of January 1st, 2004. I would like to tell you about it, and maybe it'll prevent someone else from having to go through what I had to. I can still remember that night like it was yesterday. My mom drove me to my friend's house. I gave her a hug and kiss goodbye and walked into my friend's house. We went to dinner. I can still remember exactly what I was wearing, where we went, and where we sat in the restaurant. After dinner, I decided to go out with a couple of friends. The boys arrived to pick us up and we packed ourselves into the back of a very small sports car. I always wore my seatbelt, and why I didn't that night, I will never understand. We headed to a little restaurant in Portland. While on Route 9 South, the driver decided to test out his speed. Me and the other two girls began to get very angry. When we hit what seemed like 100, we screamed for the boys to stop or at least slow down. We were so scared. We started shouting louder and louder and all grabbed onto each other as the speed increased. One of the other girls remembers the boys counting the speed up to 127 trying to beat their last record of 125. I don't remember anything after that, but was then told the driver had lost control of the car. It hit the guardrails on the right side of the highway and flipped left, rolling across Route 9 South, landing through the median, landing on Route 9 North, where it was then struck by another, another vehicle heading north. At some point, while the car was rolling, the three of us were thrown through the back window. We landed in a pile. Three witnesses in the car we passed said that we passed them well over a hundred, and as we rounded the curve, they saw our headlights flying through the air. The following information comes from one of the Cromwell EMTs, who happened to be one of the girl's mothers. When she arrived, a medical transport vehicle from Rhode Island was already on the scene. They came across the accident minutes after it had happened. She said two girls were already moved to the side. One was lying down. She had a concussion and some cuts, and the other was sitting, screaming, covered in blood, while people tried to pull larger pieces of glass from her body. She then saw one of the boys on the stretcher. He also had some cuts, and another boy standing to the side, unharmed, who turned out to be the driver. She then turned and saw me laying in the median. She said my body was face up and motionless. She thought I was dead. One of the other girls remembers holding my hand before anyone arrived and asking me to squeeze hers. She said I squeezed it once and then, the, uh, and then my eyes rolled into the back of my head. At this time, because I was unresponsive, the paramedics put me on life support right in the median while people held up lights. Someone had called for LifeStar, but both helicopters were already out on other calls, so they decided to transport me to Hartford by hospital or by ambulance. From that night on, I never took another breath on my own for 30 days. They took me to the emergency room at Hartford Hospital, where I was immediately transferred to the ICU head trauma unit. They called my parents and a chaplain spoke to my dad. All he would say is that I had been involved in a very serious auto accident and to come to Hartford Hospital emergency room. As much as my dad begged for more information, he would not tell him anything except that that very moment, I was still alive. So my mother, father, sister, and brother all got in the car and headed toward the hospital. They said no one said a word all the way there, but they all knew that their lives would never be the same. When they got to the hospital, they were sent to a tiny little waiting room till a doctor came in to talk to them. They said 15 minutes felt like forever. When the doctor came in, he finally told them that I was on life support. My eye and mouth were cut very badly. I had a pelvic fracture, a contusion of my front right lobe, and a diffusive anxonal brain injury. He told them he was not sure I would survive this. There is a Glasgow scale for head injuries entering the trauma unit, the worst of three and the best of 15. They were told that I was a three. At this point, the doctor said they could go in and be with me. As they entered the hallway of the ICU, they realized the chaplain was behind them and the nurses were all gathering around the room. My mom walked in first, and then my dad. My mom said she felt numb, 
She didn't know whether to cry, scream, or just tell herself that it wasn't really happening. My sister came in and just broke down crying, so a nurse took her down the hall. My twin brother came in, looked at me, touched my hand, and began to shake. The nurse brought him water. He took the water and started to faint. He fell backwards into a chair, spilling the water all down the front of him. My lifeless body lay in a huge bed with machines surrounding me and wires and tubes coming out of every part of me. <clears throat> my hair was full of blood. My face had road rash on it. My mouth was cut and you could see my eyeball through the large cut below my eyebrow. Eventually, the nurses and doctors told me to go home. They told my parents that if I had made it, it would be a long haul and they would need to sleep a few hours each night to get through this. They were home no longer than an hour and the doctor had called to say that my brain had begun to swell uncontrollably. They wanted permission to drill into my skull with a hairline and screw a bolt to monitor the swelling of my brain. My parents said yes, sat a few hours, and then headed back to the hospital. When they arrived, they said reality had set in. My skull was wrapped where they drilled a hole for the bolt, and a wire was running from the bolt to a machine which beeped every time my brain swelled so they would know when the pressure was too much against my skull. They had sewed up my eye, inside my mouth and lips. My road rash had begun to ooze. My face had begun to swell. Usually the third and fourth day are the worst, and then the swelling starts to go down. But for me, the second week, I was still fighting the swelling. Every part of my head was swollen. It tore the stitches in my eye open, and my tongue was so swollen it didn't even fit in my mouth. They had taken the breathing equipment out of my mouth and had given me a tracheotomy because I was still unresponsive. In these two weeks, there were many times the staff didn't think I would make it. After the doctors would come in and give the bad news each day, the nurses would say, never give up on that little window of hope. By day 21, 